Hey everyone, um, welcome to our panel. We have the founders of direct-to-consumer e-commerce businesses who have taken a turn and gone through the trenches of starting their own brick and mortar shop. So uh, to my left, I have Rich Phillip, the CEO of Brooklinen, a brand that focuses on comfort but started out with super soft bed sheets. Brooklinen opened a pop-up shop in November of last year, it ran it to February. That seemed to go well, and they're actually now prepping uh, op their own store in Brooklyn at the end of the year. And then James Reinhardt is the CEO of ThreadUp, a fashion resale platform. ThreadUp in real life, IRL, has three stores across the Bay Area and partnered with Macy's, JCPenney's, and other retailers. Susan Tynan, the CEO of Framebridge, is an online custom framing store, and Framebridge also has two physical retail stores in Bethesda, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. So first off, Rich, how about you talk, tell, tell us a little bit about what were the goals that you guys established prior to deciding, okay, now's the time to experiment with a pop-up, and we want to venture out into building a physical retail store. I think it has to do a lot with really building a relationship with your customer and being where your customer wants you to be. So um, we take that very literally online in terms of the channels that we're in for marketing. Um, we do that online and offline for that as well. But this was a natural foray for us as our audience has matured and the business has matured to really be where the customer is. It also allows us enough to have another touch point for feedback loops and you know just to get product feedback and just talk to the customer and just build a, a deeper relationship. Uh, I think it's really important to have goals, and the goals you know, for us are to make money in our stores and make sure that they are standalone businesses that do you know, provide to the bottom line of the business. But they're also a good way to really you know, put down a flag and really build the brand in market and help that e-commerce experience. So um, it's something that was successful for us, and we are actually blowing out a lot in the next um, two to three years, and we have a lot of plans uh, in motion in place in a lot of markets as well. Yeah, it's just such an interesting time to be thinking about this question because we're looking at a lot of retail stores like Forever 21, mm -hmm. recently filed for bankruptcy. And so looking at that landscape, some people would say retail is struggling right now. I mean, Susan, tell us a little bit about how you were thinking about launching Framebridge and creating these physical retail stores. Yeah, so again, I think we were pretty customer-led um, in our decision-making as well in that customers... Um, naturally wanted to drop off art with us or wanted to look at the frame styles in person. And so we even had customers coming to our corporate office, like finding us um, and coming to our corporate office with art in hand. And so we thought, well, obviously they're trying to tell us something. Um, so we approached it very similarly and said, you know, they have to be profitable um, in and of themselves, but if we can prove that they're actually lowering um, our cost to acquire a customer in the full market, then um, we, we're really onto something here. And so, so we set out to, to make sure we were measuring in that way and, and with those being our goals, um, but also making sure that it was a really seamless experience for the customer, um, wherever the customer started and wherever the customer finished, that in the entire interaction with us, we built it in such a way that, you know, it's up to you. And so, those were our goals, and I think we felt we could do it in a small enough footprint that it's not, we're not looking at Forever 21's size stores. Reach, right. um, we're looking at 1,000 square feet, and so it's a really, it's, a, it's just a different business model. Definitely. And James, please weigh in. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how ThreadUp was thinking about expanding and creating their own, your own physical stores as well as working <laughs> with other retailers. Yeah, I mean, I think we thought about it in, in two ways. I think it's similar to, to these guys. I think one was ultimately about the customer expansion. Um, so, you know, 85% of apparel is still bought in a store. People think that everything's bought on the internet. 85% is actually still bought in a physical retail format. Even the most aggressive assumptions has that, you know, getting to 65, 70% by 2030. Hmm. And so if you just sell stuff on the internet, then you, by definition, are excluding a large number of customers who might want to buy your products. And so... You know, our approach was not necessarily to know our existing customer better, but rather how do I expand the ultimate addressable market for my products? And so that was the original foray into it. I think the second is that, you know, this isn't true in San Francisco, <laughs> but in a lot of places, rents are going down, right? Commercial rents uh, are, are declining. And at the same time, you have CPMs on the two largest platforms, Facebook and Google, going like this. And so you have rents going like this and online advertising going like this. And the math starts to suggest that your acquisition leverage is better offline. 
And so I think as Susan suggested, if you can figure out a way to make the offline economics work, you can both acquire customers and not burn through a bunch of cash. And so I think in that context, those were the two things we really focused on. Um, and then the third thing that you referenced with these retail partnerships is we, we then decided, OK, well, what was the fastest way to scale our store network? And the fastest way to do that is to work with somebody who already had stores. And so we now are in 120 uh, partner locations with Macy's and JCPenney's and Stage, and we're leveraging their existing footprint. And so I think if you can do something like that, you can give yourself a way to scale much more quickly because I don't know about you guys, but like the idea of opening 100 of our own stores sounds like the worst idea ever. Yeah. Um, and so that's how we thought about it. Interesting. Yeah, thanks for sharing. So let's get into the ins and outs of launching an actual physical retail store. Um, Rich, you were kind of talking about the decision-making process of picking the location, for instance. Yep. Very intentional about that. Yep. How did you decide on Brooklyn for your flagship store later this year? It's made a lot of sense for us from a branding perspective. Our business is based there, our team is based there, and it's our best market, and it's where you know the business really started. So those were our early adopters, and the real evangelists are there. And that's not to say that actually San Francisco is our second biggest market, and you know we have customers everywhere. But it's really a home base for us when we think about that. And then as we expand, you know, we have a few levers to pull that we're analyzing. And I would say like the three buckets that we zoom in on are. And do we leverage a regional strategy that you know we are from New York and New York is big and people move? So is it a northeast and grow from there? Is it a big commercial market strategy where you're looking at Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, really the biggest markets? And those are probably the biggest revenue drivers, but not necessarily the biggest ROI. And then you have ones where we really over-index, you know, versus you know expectations or incumbents there. And these are more of you know young professional growing markets. So the, the Nashvilles, the Austins, the Denver, Colorados, and Portlands. Those are also opportunities. So we're weighing and we'll, you know, we'll probably pursue a hybrid of those at the end of the day, but I think those are the lanes that we've identified as the opportunities to pursue. Interesting, yeah. And Susan, when you were thinking about Rambridge, your strategy with Maryland and DC, were you also considering w which factors? Yeah, so I think same thing. I think all of us probably operational ease, right? We've tested in our home market. Um, and then, you know, standing up retail stores is a new enough discipline to at least make it easier on yourself by being close by. And then we just overlaid our customer data to figure out where to go, and that will be our path moving forward. And I do think that's a benefit of businesses starting online. We, we actually really know by the block where to go. Yeah. Got it. And James, you took a little different tact with ThreadUp in terms of there's a clustering strategy, like all these stores are located in the Bay Area. Can you talk a little bit about why you guys decided to do that and then maybe branch out into how these partnerships with big box retailers worked out? Yeah, I mean, well, we learned a really painful lesson. We, we tried to build stores. We had a store in Texas. We had a store in the South Bay. Uh, we had a store um, in, in a different part of Texas that was from far away. And that was a terrible idea. Um, you know, you need to build the stores as these guys did close to you so that you can keep an eye on them. The mistake we made was we were really focused on how cheap the rent was. The problem is when the rent is really cheap, that means nobody goes there. <laughs> and so um, I think one of the things that like, we've learned about the store strategy is, you know, what are you trying to solve for, right? So, you know, when Zara, for example, opens stores, they have the most expensive real estate. They're open right on the main streets and all these areas because they think about stores like marketing. And they don't even probably care about the profitability of the Newberry Street store in Boston, right? It's just there. Um, so I think for us, it was ult ultimately about brand awareness and, and how do we get uh, the number of... Um, uh, visits into the into the experience and so we started with this cluster strategy because we thought about it a lot like billboards and so if you think about you know in a, a, when you buy billboards in a particular region there's a bunch of them you don't just buy one and so we thought okay well let's open three stores all within the same area where a customer then in the northern part of the Bay Area San Francisco San Jose Oakland might think we're absolutely really big because there are three stores mm -hmm. Like, oh my God, these guys must be everywhere, right? And so let's just see if we can get that density to work and then we can bring that cluster to other spots. Um, I think that lesson doesn't apply to everyone because what's unique about our business is because all the products are unique, everything's secondhand, we can benefit by having a bunch of those stores where chances are the products in your stores are the same in some of the other stores. And so um, you maybe don't want them so close together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and if I'll, I'll add that Please. it's... it's 
not coincidental that we all really started in our home markets as well, because I think uh, the math only takes you so far, so you know what the rent is, it could be very affordable. Uh, the demographics say that this is the customer that's there, but you really can't trade that for what you know in your backyard, and you know yeah. who drives there, who walks there, like who the actual customer is, and that's something that's an advantage of, A, we have the data to support it, and also the intuition of like our home market, which really, really helps, and I think that's really steered the strategy, which seems consistent for all of us. Yeah, definitely. Um, James, before I let you go, I would love to actually hear, what was the conversation like with the JCPenney's and the Macy's when you were talking about actually scaling ThreadUp? And it was long, <laughs> long. I, I, I mean, I think <clears throat> what I've learned in the process of building out these partner stores is, you know, you really need to make sure that the experience for this large partner who can give you incredible distribution, um, that it's really aligned with what they're trying to accomplish as an organization. And so um, you can really never convince anybody at a large Fortune 100 company to do something that they don't already want to do. And so what we were trying to convince them of is you guys want to get younger. Um, you want to provide more reasons for your customers to come into your stores. I can solve that problem. Like people who shop secondhand are young people. People who shop secondhand, they come into stores more frequently because the products always change. And so I really relied on that as my, like, my two talking points. So every time I got a chance to spend time with the leadership teams there, I would say, you're trying to solve this problem, I can help. You know, and eventually um, they come around. And you know, so now we're in 40 Macy's, 30 JCPenney's. Uh, we have 30 with another retailer in the South. Uh, and so now the question is, how do we get it to go from 40 to 400? Wow, yeah, we'll get back to quality control in a minute. <laughs> but Rich, Brooklyn Inn is very focused on maintaining this brand around comfort. It's a lifestyle brand. So tell us a little bit about your brand storytelling in these physical stores and how you envision the physical in-person experience will differ from the online shopping experience. Hopefully not all that much. It should be more of a physical manifestation of what we created online and with enhancements and more of a personal touch point. Um, when we started the business, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the commentary around our style, which was very, very um, heavily emphasized on customer service. Um, everyone that joins the team does customer service for a few weeks, and we really want to listen to the customer. So it's very like Main Street-y the way we do business in terms of you know, trying to handshake. If we could do that with everybody online, we would, but this really gives us an opportunity to. So you know, in terms of merchandising, we're looking at the markets, what people, we, again, we have data we can lean into. So you know, in Minnesota, people are buying different than in Florida, so we can merchandise accordingly, and we have the advantage of having really big data sets for that as well. And we want to bring, you know, in some ways, and we discussed before, we're a victim of our own success of customer expectations. People love the product, they come back, buy more, they refer friends. So that's a high bar to live up to. So you can't have really like a janky store experience that doesn't meet the expectation, then you're disjointed there. So we set the bar high and we really have to execute in that way. And that's how we're thinking about it is that we have to exceed what they're expecting of us from our online experience, which is, uh, has been good so far. Yeah, there was also mention of just programming, doing events yeah. and gatherings. How do you think um, that's like part of the customer expectation these days well, for these store? It's not about shopping anymore, it's about an experience. Totally. Um, the problem with retail and the incumbents, it's not that they're, the retail is dying, it's just changing, and I think there's more of an onus on the brand to build that relationship with the customer. And I think it goes beyond the products. It's, you know, who are you, what do you stand for, why are you doing this, and who are the people behind it? So uh, we learned that, that you know, from our experiments, that it's not an if you build it, they will come situation, and just there, you have to engage with them, you have to market. We had a lot of program, a lot of events, we had, you know, pop-up experiences within hours of like-minded brands, we had panels, we had workshops uh, in all different arenas, and it's, a, it's bringing awareness, and it's bringing different sets of people together, and, you know, it's not a salesy experience, like, here, buy this, buy this, buy this, but it's, hey, we're here, and we're part of the community now, so, you know, just keep us in mind next time, really, so it's like a soft sell more for awareness, and that stuff is really important, whereas if, you know, legacy retailers, you're in a mall, you kind of just set up shop and you hope people pass by and buy. It's not really the same way anymore. Mm. Yeah. Susan, for FrameBridge, what kind of data are you gathering about your customers, either from the physical store that's informing your online presence or vice versa? Um, sure. So again, first is site selection. So we, we know where our customers live um, and we certainly know online um, what they like from a merchandising perspective. Um, but I think it, it was important uh, for us from the beginning, obviously, to build our stores in such a way where we have the same notion of the customer. And so our, it's the same customer. And, and so we 
you know, the experience for the customer, the back end is the same. We know what the customer has ordered wherever they've ordered it, and um, we can be relevant to them when they come to us. So I think, I think that was, you know, uh, I think important for all brands like ours going into retail is not to lose the advantage you have being online. And so if you bring those advantages and that advantage is knowing the customer, truly having the customer data and history, um, I think you're actually at, at an advantage even getting into a new discipline. Great. And we also have a question from the audi audience. How do you find people who can interpret your brand for the real world? Is it the same people building your digital products or totally different teams? So in the process of making this transition and expanding your business, how are you building your teams? What does the composition look like? Yeah. Susan? You start. So um, and this, I think, is really interesting because um, we're startup people, so we believe we can teach ourselves anything. Um, but there are some things about retail that are just hard and fast rules. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that we had a team of people who represented both what is sort of uniquely Framebridge and, and came from the, um, the spirit of we're um, changing this old industry, so we do everything different, but also that we had some people who knew how to, how to actually stand up a retail store. So we actually hired someone um, a, a, from a traditional retail background um, and a lot of what she and her um, early team have brought to us in terms of um, um, some foundational things about, again, some of the real estate and construction management um, pieces have been invaluable, but then from the experience and store design perspective, trying to really stay true to who we are or the new approach because um, again, they're obviously retail wouldn't be retail broadly wouldn't be in the condition it's in today if they were doing everything right. So it's really just trying to figure out what pieces are, are like you have to adhere to because that's just the way retail works and what pieces like for us in our category, the piece you have to ignore is the upselling piece like that's core to our business is is this sort of democratization of framing and that you come in and you're not intimidated and there's clear up from pricing well all the old tricks of retail then you know might not apply in that way hmm. rich james i mean for, for us it was it, it was similar trying to find somebody within the industry i think i, I was looking for somebody her, her name is heather craig she's still with us who, who's doing a terrific job and I was looking for somebody who was basically not a fit at a traditional retailer because she wanted to move fast, break shit, not take no for an answer, open things faster than she was supposed to, make lots of mistakes. And Sounds so, familiar. You know, and so we wanted to interview, you know, when I was interviewing the process, I was looking for a true rebel and I would, uh, you know, and then harness her, her energy. And I think, she, so I was looking for somebody, and the, but the hardest thing is you're trying to bring somebody in with a bunch of experience and then have them work in a startup environment where, the answer is just go faster. Yeah. And, um, and I think sometimes that those people can be really successful. Um, and then sometimes it's just really hard to figure out whether they're going to flame out or not. And um, we've been very fortunate, uh, but, but we've made just a ton of mistakes. And I think the thing I would give the team credit for is that they've not been like, they haven't threatened the company's I was like, like, don't put the company in jeopardy, but like <laughs> break a lot of stuff. And, um, and so I think we're learning, we're learning our way through it. Um, but look, retail is hard, and I totally agree. Everybody, we think we know everything and we can figure it out. And, you know, it's much more complicated than that. Great. Oh. And uh, J James, I do want to circle back on the scaling challenge that you guys have sure. at ThreadUp uh, in terms of just placing all this inventory in all these different stores. How do you crunch that data, and what does that look like for you guys? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we're getting, you know, well over 100,000 unique pieces of clothing every day uh, into our facilities. Uh, and so we go through all that clothing, we put it online. Um, and then the question is, you know, you have 3 million items uh, in, a, in a thread up secondhand store. How do you choose the, you know, the 3,000, right, to go in a physical uh, location? And we, we, the answer is we sort of, we use a little bit of data um, and we use a little bit of a, of a merchandising perspective. Uh, and the, the biggest challenge is figuring out, is using the data and allowing it to teach you what to replenish with. And so what we have learned is anytime we put a collection in a store, in a partner store, in our own store, it's inevitably going to be wrong the first time. And we will be, but we will be able to see that it turns out cardigans are selling really well and denim doesn't sell well and blouses sell really well and nobody buys black and nobody, right? But the, the beauty of it is that we're able to then replenish that store very, very efficiently. 
And, um, and I think that's sort of been our mantra with these partner stores. Uh, but it is hard. You know, you're a 500 square foot um, pop-up inside a 20,000 square foot box. Right. And um, so we're, we're figuring it out. <laughs> I wouldn't say we have it all figured out yet. All right. We just have a couple minutes left. Um, what is the most common mistake you see digital brands making when trying to expand their real world presence? A uh, question from the audience. Rich. Yeah, I mean, something I'm very like conscious and cautious about, conscious of and cautious, cautious about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very aware of. <laughs> yeah, I'm very aware, I'm very aware of it. That um, I think a lot of brands and founders can get ahead of their skis on it. Just there's a herd mentality of if they're doing it, then we have to do it. And, you know, it's really hard to say, as James said it before, it's hard to think like we'd open X number of stores. I think that number is 10 and then 50 and then 100. It all seems very far, like no matter what the number is. So to put, you know, something out there that says we're going to open 100 stores in the next three years, it sounds a little ridiculous to me because you're constantly trying to learn and iterate on these things. And it's both from an organizational sense, merchandising sense, real estate sense, like everything across the board, that if you go a little slower and you watch and observe and iterate and you get it, you have a better probability of getting it right rather than just moving too quickly. And then it can all tear down really quickly, which is a cautionary tale and something that I would be scared of. But I, I think slow and steady is actually advantageous in, in this field. So. Compared to e-commerce, when it comes to physical retail, is it a myth that when, as you scale, it gets easier to manage? Or is it the inverse, where it's like, as you scale, there's actually just much more complicated operations involved? I don't think it ever gets easier to manage <laughs> as you scale. I don't think that's, that's, that's the way it works in any space, yeah. physical or online. That's just not a reality of the situation. It's a common misconception that I think all founders kind of fool themselves for, that it's, it's going to happen. Um, I think physical because there's build out and there's leases and a lot of stuff that like takes time. It's a little slower, so you can't be as agile with that. Um, with, whereas e -com, you can move way quicker and you could scale a brand much quicker online because you can be so agile and there are a lot of tools and bells and whistles to help you segment and personalize, which, um, which give you an advantage that it's a little more clunky and you try and minimize that in physical, but it's still a thing that is in the way. Great. Yeah. Um, Susan, did you want to weigh in? Well, I'd just say that retail, obviously, it you're scaling people too, right? So yeah. it, it's different than software. Um, I think for our business, we had, you know, a part of our business that looked like a technology company and part of our business that looked like a manufacturing business. And now we've tacked on retail. So it's even just, you know, hiring different disciplines and um, um, making sure that, you know, the framework experience is positive for, for now retail associates. It's just like a whole new thing. So I think, um, yeah, it's just you have to scale uh, with intention. I would say one thing. People ask me whether they should open stores or not, and I always ask them the same qu two questions. I say, what is your customer acquisition cost right now? Right, and they give me a number. And I say, if, it weren't, if I cut it in half, would you still be opening stores? And inevitably, they say no. And so what, you know, and, and the, the brands that I talk to. So I really push people like, you know, you, the reason to open stores is I think really to create more, um, you know, omni-channel value offline, online that one plus one really does equal three. I think if you're doing it in the pursuit of just for growth, I think it's a risky thing because it is not easier. <laughs> it, is not, it is not easier, right? And so like, I think you like, in your heart of hearts need to believe that you're doing something that you need to have that combination. Um, otherwise, I think you're just, you should be spending more time figuring out how to lower your cost of acquisition on Facebook. Wow. Agreed. Well said. And just in terms of customer expectations, we talk about the in-store experience and um, it's, it's evolved quite a bit from like walking around the mall, but now to actually hosting events. Um, Rich, what have you seen from just like your pop-up of actually wanting to engage with the founders or really about maintaining the brand storytelling? What are some other aspects that other people should take into consideration when they are thinking about launching their physical retail store? I think you have to uh, approach it with a testing framework. So, you know, you're willing to iterate and be agile on that and you have to learn very, very quickly. So something we did uh, on that front and I would advise Eddie that are you know, planning to do this, is we had somebody from our corporate team on the floor every day, and we rotated. So they would come back, and they would do an internal questionnaire. It was, like, it was quick. It was a couple questions. It's like, what was the most common question you heard? You know, what were some observations you made? And because we're all you know, working together and collaborating in the corporate office, and people have more visibility to what's going on, that was really, really helpful to keep building. So 
and also you get that feedback. But people get really excited to meet the corporate team and the people that are building the website or you know, doing the operations or in the creative team or whatever it is. And I think it's symbiotic, so it's good for both. It's good, very good for the corporate team as well because they get to see the end customer and interact with them. So it actually is like a validation of their work as well. So I think that's, you know, it seems rather basic, but it's actually quite important to learn and you know, optimize both sides. Well said. And Susan, when you're talking about FrameBridge, um, what were your KPIs? If not growth, then like what kind of metrics were you guys measuring to make sure like, okay, this retail store is worth the investment? Yeah, I mean, certainly growth is part of it. And I think, I think that the addressable market expansion was important. So we're looking at percentage of new users. We're looking, well, one, all the store KPIs in terms of traffic and version, et cetera. But, um, percentage of new users, certainly. And then um, importantly was the growth in the average order value. And so that was just meaningfully higher than online. And so there's something there we have to note and, and think about and figure out why and see if we can replicate some of that online, but also acknowledge that um, that's telling us something about how customers want to interact. And James, when you're talking about your threat ups in real life stores versus all the store in stores, how are you deciding exactly like what type of inventory to showcase? Because millions of unique garments, um, are different customers hitting different stores for different types of clothing? Is it more luxury items? Like how are you thinking through what to feature when you're getting so much supply? Yeah, I mean we triangulate across on, on, on really a couple of things, um, or I guess by definition three things. So we look at the data that we're selling in that uh, location, that, that zip code. So if we are opening a store in Missoula, we say, okay, what are we currently selling in Missoula? Data point number one. We then say, okay, well, what is um, our partner? Like what's their like merchandising strategy um, with uh, the stories they're trying to tell in store? Data point number two. And then the third is, okay, well, what sort of product do we have available? to meet the needs of that particular community. Because it may turn out that stuff's selling really, really well in that particular zip code online, but we may not have the product or SKU depth to support that in a store uh, format. For example, one of the stores where one of our partners wanted a ton of leopard print. I was like, sure, love leopard. We don't have you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of units, like brand new every day, love leopard. And so that was an example where we, the data point said we wanted more leopard, and we said, okay, well, how about zebra? You know, um, we pick something <laughs> else. Print, Snake print, right? <laughs> um, and, and so I think that's the way we use the data. And then again, and then back to you know my prior point is like we see what's then selling, and then we refresh based on that. Great. And just in the last five minutes of our session, I'd love to just hear across the panel what are you most excited about when it comes to this synergy between e-commerce and retail? Um, Rich, do you want to kick things off? Yeah, um, I'm excited for what it's going to bring to the business in the next phase because uh, you know, as Susan Th said, growth is important and enhancing the brand and the business that we build, but uh, by far the most fulfilling part is physically interacting with the customers because Yes, we do it in e-commerce thousands of times per day, but that's very, very different than actually seeing a smile on a face. People take the bag and go, and then go home afterwards. And that's you, know, you understand how they consider and how long they're taking. Like it's different from like your Google Analytics or any metrics you use to like seeing it live. Mm -hmm. So the learnings we take from that and the enhancements we could give to the brand as a whole because of that is something that I'm most eager to dig into personally. Okay, James. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, the Forever 21 bankruptcy is a, is a funny thing because years ago what we were looking at the data and you were starting to see in droves people not shopping fast fashion because of the uh, pollution and uh, the challenge that it presents for the environment. And so I think the thing that I'm most excited about is you're starting to see traditional retail or traditional brands embrace secondhand and resale as a way to serve their customer at lower price points. And I think, that's I think that's better for people's wallets. I think it's better for the planet. And so I think the thing I'm most excited about is you're starting to see this transition from uh, young people in particular buying a bunch of stuff that they plan to only wear once and then throw out into a more sustainable future. And I think that's only going to compound over the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Susan. Yeah, I'm excited to meet customers um, where they want us. And so I think we just hear a lot of customers say, you know, I heard of your brand, I was thinking about trying, but it just didn't, and then the store is the time to. So I'm excited to just show up for them, right? I think they want, they want 
to frame things they love. They just want to do it in an easier way. And so we want to be in their neighborhood. Great. Well, thank you so much to our panelists for um, this wonderful discussion. And yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.